What is up, everybody? Welcome into this all new episode of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. A semi bittersweet episode today, I guess, for a couple of different reasons. One, the Packers are eliminated, of course. Two, because this is our last Mike Wall episode of the season. I'm sure we'll touch base a couple of times during the offseason, but Mike, it's been phenomenal having you all season long. Thank you so much for doing this. Welcome back. How that could be been? Another great week. Uh, this is my favorite. For if you're a football guy, I think the the uh, AFC NFC Championship weekend is the best weekend of football uh, of the entire year. Even though the Packers aren't playing, so I'm looking forward to this weekend. Obviously, we got a lot of talk about talk about with regards to Green Bay, but uh, I'm always excited about this this weekend in particular when it comes to the NFL. Yeah, I love this one too. Super Bowl always seems a little bit commercially, and it just doesn't always feel quite like the the normal game that's played. But yeah, go ahead. Fifty-seven thousand five hundred dollars for tickets in uh, for the for the game in 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 Las Vegas. I think the cheapest. I want to say the cheapest seats are somewhere uh, somewhere in the rafters for like seven grand now. So just oh. like what you just said is is exactly why I think players and and you know diehard fans, AFC NFC championships the best because it's just gotten too much. There's you know there's just too much concern about who's playing at halftime now. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you there. It feels like the, the most competitive football. There's not like a bazillion commercial breaks. It's just, I don't know, it, it, I'm with you. It's an amazing week of football. I can't wait for it. It's two really fun games as well. We'll get into that in the end. I want to start a little bit after the Packers 49ers game, specifically with some of the moves that Green Bay has made this week, starting with the direction that they've decided to go in, moving, uh, moving on from Joe Barry. Um, first of all, just your thoughts on the decision to move on from Joe Barry, and then we can kind of go into what's next after that. I wasn't surprised by it. Um, you know, you never want to call for somebody's job, and you like the the kind of uptick in performance they had over the last couple of weeks. And I, like like every other week, you can kind of point to some things. Like, does Debo Samuel worth 10, 14 points in that game? What does that look like if you're 34 or 38 points uh, in that last one? But <clears throat> the overall underperformance of that side of the football for the last couple of years, um, I, I think – I think once you get in the hot seat, regardless of, you know, externally in the hot seat, I'm not necessarily matters, but I know in that building, you know, if, if you start feeling like you're in the hot seat, it's only a matter of time. And very, very rarely do those guys completely turn it around. Um, there's a reason that they're in a hot seat. It, it's usually you're, you're not connecting at some level with the players that you have in the building, whether you're, whether they don't believe in the scheme that you're running, which I, again, I'm not sure this is necessarily the case with Joe Barry, but you don't believe that the scheme you're running or you're not teaching it well enough to execute. It's like one of those two things. So um, I, I do think it's it's time to to go out and find somebody that maybe complements this, what we're looking like as a championship caliber offense. I think there's it's time to go find somebody that complements this offense from a philosophical standpoint on the defensive side of the football. I'm with you, not surprised. And I think it was probably the right direction to go in and, you said once it sort of gets to that point, it feels like the writing's on the wall. It, it felt like it was there. Didn't see enough progression over the last three seasons to really make it of like, all right, is this is this worth trying for one more season? Let me ask you this. If, you, if you're looking at this defense, what – and I know this is probably almost an impossible question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Like what percentage of this defense not living up to expectations in your, in your mind is coaching, scheme, you know, in, in personnel, like if you had to like group it into buckets, where are you at of like, what are the biggest issues on this defense right now? I told you it was a hard I, one. No, it's, well, it, it's, it's a really long answer, I, I think, but here's, here's basically how the NFL works now, in my, my opinion. And I think the Green Bay is unfortunately probably, you know, probably guilty of some of this. Back in the day, your quarterbacks got treated a certain way because they were your quarterbacks especially when they're on the second contract. Right. Nowadays, a lot of people who make over, let's just call it the arbitrary number, over $10 million a year, over $8 million, they get treated a certain way now too. They're, they're kind of put up on a pedestal that maybe a little bit more than they, than they could be. Um, and the young guys see that. And so maybe their preparation changes. Maybe it's being allowed to change. Maybe they're allowed to be late to meetings or, or not practice as hard, whatever the case may be. And if you allow that and you condone that, then some younger players on your team look at that and they go, well, I'm there too, even though they're not there. And I think there's a lot of that all over the, the national football league. I, I'm sure there's a little bit of that in, in, in green Bay. And it, that, I mean, that's what it, that's how it feels from a, from a player's perspective. I would think, I would say this, you've got some guys that have just proven commodities in the national football league. You have your, you have your Kenny Clarks, um, 
You know, Preston Smith has been playing in this league at a high level for a long time. Rashawn Gary seems, you know, he had some up and downs. I think you're going to find out that his injury was more severe than his in, injury history this year was more severe than, than we know. But he's a guy that just seems to be doing everything the right way, and you could be happier for him. You got some young guys, you know, that a guy that had a really good year a couple of years ago, Devondre Campbell, but he's been a journeyman guy. Um, Quay Walker has got, he's one of the more athletic linebackers in the league. He just needs some, you know, some more kind of um, more finishing school, you know. Um, when I look at the team in its entirety, though, you, you start seeing, you start seeing some of the behaviors in, in, in these, you know, when, when Rasul Douglas leaves and everybody goes, well, he was kind of holding us together. Like that is a huge flag because holding you together from what, you yeah. know, you, you know what I mean? So I, I, without getting too far into, there's no finger pointing here, but I would say this, I would say that if at the very, very top, if it's being allowed it, then at the DC position, it's be, it has to be allowed or, you know, it's being allowed. He doesn't necessarily run the ship differently than like, you know, whoever, anybody else who's in, above him. Right. And then because of kind of all of this stuff, um, I think sometimes if you just get the mix of different personalities and whatnot, like maybe some of these guys, maybe the young guys aren't developing as, as, as fast as or quickly as they should. And then maybe some of the old guys are not having the attention to detail they did, they did when they were younger. But I can look at all of that and go, if I'm, a, if I'm talking to my teammates, I'm going, that's on you. But if I'm sitting out here I'm, as a 46-year-old guy, I'm going, you got to, the coach has to do something different. The message has to be different. The, the 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 standard has to be different. The way that we conduct ourselves in meetings, the way we talk to one another, the way that we're constantly on are, are you know on each other's asses about the details of the of the positional requirements, that has to be different. So it's always easy. It's like um, it's like it's like tackling the obesity problem in the United States, right? We're like forty percent obese now, and it's like I, it's easy for me to say like eat less, man, do some exercise, right? But if to an individual. But if you look at the entirety of the group, it's like you have to have some structural changes if you want people to change, right? So depends on how you want to look at it, man. No, I'm with you. I think it's I think it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I think going in a direction from a coaching standpoint was the right move. But I do think there is uh, some personnel changes that need to be made, specifically in the secondary. I do think players need to be held a little bit more accountable to play to the level that they're capable of playing at. And hopefully that all comes together this season because to your point, they have a championship caliber offense from like the get-go right now, and they need to match that on defense and hopefully put together another magical season. Let me ask you, is there, whether it's a coordinator or a scheme or a style or anything that you see that's going on in the NFL that you would like to see Green Bay adopt and adapt to moving forward as they do look to hire a new defensive coordinator? I always, I like the 3-4 defense because it, it puts – it puts up better athletes, more better athletes on, on the field. So I, yeah. you'd like to stick with the three, four. What, I, what, what you'd like to see is a better utilization, maybe out of that three, four of some of the different fronts that are capable. Like you don't even have, always have to run a jam with two defensive ends, right? You, like there's different things you can do there. So that part of it, I think you, you'd like to, to have some more talking about. When I when I think about from a player standpoint of the most difficult defenses to to play against in the league, most of those defense are defenses are first of all they're aggressive downhill attacking defenses. There's not too gapping, and, and the second thing is they will because they have they have very good safeties, linebackers, and, and and slot players. They can play up at the line of scrimmage and give the offense something to really think about as far as who's bringing pressure looks. And to do that, like I think you quite frankly you have the personnel to do that now. Yeah. Um, the thing that has to change is, and it's you know, it's called you have to build mastery, and then you have to empower those people to be able to to decide whether or not a the coverage or the uh, the, the play calls wrong, I got to call it off, or b Andy, you go, I'm staying in because the back pointed to me and he didn't point to you, like that little stuff like that. You got to yep. be able to master the positional requirements, and then the coaches have to empower those guys to do that. So, I think there's a philosophical break now in, in the National Football League where a lot of guys will go, well, I want to run like I want to run the Fangio stuff. Let's say you know, cover two, you know, Ben, but don't break. Or I, maybe there's guys that are still like a Pete Carroll. I'm going to run a cover three. My technique and my, my aggressiveness is going to be better than everybody else. There's going to be guys that want to run a lot of uh, rolling coverages and play. like all of that's fine. I'm, I, I'm more attuned to as an offensive lineman, knowing what, what is difficult, penetrating, attacking downhill, put multiple guys at the line of scrimmage and make make quarterbacks make the wrong decision. 
I'm with you. Totally, totally with you. I think they need to be a bit more aggressive, a, a bit more multiple in their looks, a bit more adaptable to what the offense is doing. I always felt like if the offense did catch them in a blitz or if they caught them and it was able, like the defense never had a way to check out of anything. It just, it didn't feel very adaptable to what the offense was doing. The last question I want to ask you about this is as of right now, the only person that's changed position or has been let go is Ben Joe Barry. As far as we know, and again, as we're recording this, all the assistant defensive coaches are still on staff. Mm -hmm. Is it important or how important is it that if they do hire a new defensive coordinator, that that defensive coordinator would get the opportunity to bring in his own assistants or to interview the current assistants? Or is it not that important? Does it not matter? Like, how do you kind of view that process? Well, generally... <sighs> NFL is so weird. I've, I've said this on the show before. There's some really good high school football coaches out there that coach in the NFL in a heartbeat. And I don't know why some guys get in and some don't. But for whatever reason, there's, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, is it Fangio that just went back to Philly? Yeah. That's yeah. What it's, 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 it's mm -hmm. like there's, there's more than 32 DC capable DCs in, in the world. It, it's bizarre to me. But having said all that, when you, when you come back, <clears throat> I think the defensive coordinator, whoever the coordinator, the new guy is, he probably has the, the the right to to interview the people that are currently in the building. I don't think a lot of coaches, I don't think a lot of DCs, unless it's your first time and you just feel like you have to take a gig, I, I wouldn't take the gig if you said I have to keep all your same coaches. Now, I know I've known situations that's happened. It never turns out well. Right. You always have to make some sort of change. There's a personality. There's a philosophical agreement. And, and the, the bigger thing with the DC is you're the head coach of the defense. So if I'm the DC, Andy, and I think you're really, really smart, you're a defensive backs coach. But you won't use the language that I use, or you have a t different. You have a you have a way to do things that doesn't vibe with what I'm doing, and I don't agree with it. You won't stop. You got to go, you know. Yeah. And and that's what happens when you have a lot of these holdovers. Even though, you know, most of these guys are smart enough to understand, like you're not going to be with one team for your entire career, so you have to kind of be able to interchange and, and work with different people. But you know, especially I always had I always found this when we, when we just dealt with like tackling. You got guys coming from eight different teams. There's eight different languages. Instead of having one language for the building, they'd have eight different languages. And when that happens, it gives people reason to fail. It felt a little bit that way with the Jerry Gray, Joe Barry situation, where it felt like the defensive backs and Jerry Gray wanted to do it one way and Joe Barry and then the floor and the coaches like wanted to do it a different way. And eventually you end up with Jerry Gray leaving and uh, them going with a def different defensive backs uh, coach in that situation. And yeah, I just, I, I'm with you. I do feel like it's important, especially if you're bringing in like an established defensive coordinator yeah. and you want to give full autonomy to him and say, you like, I, I'm at LaFleur. I don't want to go in and have to check on what's going on. I just want you to have total control of this so I can do all the offense stuff and head coaching stuff. It does feel more important that if you're bringing in someone like that, they can get their own guys. Yeah, so I was looking at it this way. There's got to be a, a head coach's way of doing business in the building. Like Matt LaFleur, and I don't know if this is, if he has this or not. I mean, based on our special teams and defense, but yeah, maybe it, maybe it's just not there. But I, I feel like – and it, I'm, I'm, I'm making an example, but I, this isn't necessarily true. But, like, you should be able to – the defensive corner should – the first day, he should get, like, a three-ring binder from the head coach. Hey, this is the way the Packers do business, according to me, because I'm the boss, right? Yeah. This is how we talk about things. This is our expectation, blah, 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 all of this stuff. And then the defensive coordinator, depending on you know how how fluent that head coach is in, in defense, for example, can be like, this is the way we talk about cover six. This is the way that we talk about tackling. This is the way we're going to teach it. This is the way we learn how to break down. This is our communication. Everything is – I can hand any any coach the book, and this is what we're going to do, right? And there's there's no if, and, or buts about it. If you don't like it, get out of my house, right? It's, yeah. it's that it's, – and if it's not that way – um, I mean, there's, you know, having said that there's always room for collaboration in the off season and trying to figure out what the best situation is. But my point to you is when this is established, it has to be canon law almost. Right. And if it's not, I think that's where a lot of guys get in trouble. And, and sometimes with these, that's why, that's why I like, uh, like you like the Dan Campbell's of the world a little bit because they don't call plays, but you know, that every, like every single person in the building there's there is no question as to who's running the show, how the show is going to be run, and all of those coaches seem to be on the same page. No, I'm, it, it's totally true, and I, I think they've done a tremendous job in Detroit. It'll be interesting to see how they set it up in Green Bay and what type of defensive coordinator they have, um, what type of autonomy they have. Is it an experienced one? Is it a, is it a new guy that's never run a defense before? All that will be super interesting, and to see how Matt Lafleur how involved he is and engaged in it, or is it just like, Hey, 
you do your thing, I'm going to do my thing. And it's a little bit separate, but I'm with you. I think the best ones are more collaborative and have that sort of approach of like, this is the way we're doing business. I'm going to have my thumb on everything in this building. Um, and here's the way that you can do it. But within those guidelines, you can run the defense the way that you want. But it'll all be very interesting. They obviously did, made another move as well. Uh, we just talked recently about Chris Gizzy and the strength and conditioning program and, uh, you know, kind of really the, the talent that was in that room. Um, Green Bay decides to go in a different direction. They made the official announcement as we're recording this uh, that Chris Gizzy is, in fact, gone. Your thoughts on the decision and how Green Bay makes the change from here? Well, I think the tough part about like to me, the strength and conditioning coach could be the, the second most important person in your building as far as being able to develop physically, develop the culture of the team, really having the really having the finger on the pulse of each, each individual player. He spends more time with the players than you know than really than anybody else. Um, and that staff, uh, the, the monitoring that they're able to do. I mean, the recovery, the nutri all of that that falls under the performance umbrella is so so important. So, um, the hard part about Quite frankly, the hard part about the National Football League is like most coaches don't know what they don't know when it pertains to the strength and conditioning world, the performance world. And, and you know, a lot of guys have an idea of what they want to do. Maybe they don't have a background in that industry. Like, you know, so it's I sometimes wonder if it's better to just have like the old Mike Holmgren approach. Like, did you work out? Yeah. OK. Hey, are they working out? OK, good. And then just move on because, you know, when, when coaches get um, – it happens like, you know, Christian Watson's had his hamstring. So in the media, they're talking about, you know, it's just like fans are going, well, what's going on in that room? Because you know, his hamstrings hurt all the time. And I think coaches do that a little bit as well, as far as we're just going to have an emotional reaction to this problem. We don't really know what the problem is. And so who's the easiest person to blame? Well, it's the athletic trainer. It's the it's the strength conditioning coach, et cetera. Um, I, I would just say that it, aside from that, these relationships aren't, aren't meant to last forever. Um, yeah. and, and, and certainly – you know, personalities and, and fits aren't, you know, like some guys want, some guys want a calm dude. Some guys want the guy, you know, Ted Rath's like one of my, my dearest, you know, strength and conditioning coach friends. He's the guy for Philadelphia that, you know, was the get back guy. And he's on the sideline going nuts all the time. Like some guys want that. So it, it's, yeah. it's just the strength and conditioning coach is, is so much more than um, just his certifications and the way he teaches. It's also the interactions he has with the head coach and and, and kind of the, the vision that the head coach has for that part of the program. So Gizzy is a thought leader in the space. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. He's one of the most personal guys I've ever been around. He'll they'll they'll feel that loss um you know to some severity, but it, it obviously this the severity of how they feel it is going to be dependent on how they've actually been using his talents. So I don't know they've been maximizing his talents to be fair. I know the listeners are going to want to know: Are, are you uh, are you updating the old resume uh, for any uh, you know positions this uh, this off season that are open in the NFL? I I, uh, I really enjoy working with individual guys right now. Um, I I love I love being I would love to be in a building, but I, I would hate to have to work for somebody who didn't uh, you know in this like this situation makes me yeah. reminds me to go. You just fired arguably the smartest guy that at least I know in your building um, that is gets along with everybody. It, it, for the only reason I can think of is that you're not using him the way he's meant to be used. Why would I want to subject myself to that? Good answer. Very good answer. Uh, all right. Let's talk about uh, another topic, of course, of this past week, and that is the Packers, unfortunately, losing to the San Francisco 49ers. I know you went back, watched the tape, probably rewatched the tape. For you, what did you see in this game? What went wrong? And why are the Packers not playing the Lions in the uh, NFC Championship game this week? Uh, well, I, really, it kind of boils down to two things. I think the first thing is that details matter when you're playing elite teams. The, the Niners have been the best team in the NFC the entire year. So when you have a chance to get a pick six early in the game, um, when you drop a, a potential second pick, you know some of these, some of these, uh, you know, maybe missed opportunities in the passing game early on. When you miss those opportunities against good teams. It it allows them and allows their elite level athletes that we talked about before. I mean, your Packers are looking at their future. Hopefully, right? They've got they've got a George Kittle. You know, Debo gets hurt, but they they have Christian McCaffrey. They have Juwan Jennings can come in and play a little bit. Trent Williams is a complete you know road grader that's on that side of the line. When you've got those elite level players, like you're, they're going to make plays eventually. Brock Purdy's a good player. He's going to make plays eventually. And so everything seemed ripe for the Packers to win. Debo gets hurt. Um, our defensive line is quite frankly tearing up everybody not named Trent on their offensive line. 
you know, they we we have the almost the early, we get up, we we score early, and you know, that you almost have the turnover the next year. Uh, everything's just kind of set up to be successful. They're not as good without Debo. Like everybody knows the the, the narrative. It's raining outside. Brock's not throwing some a, a lot of great passes early on. But you have to like you have to capitalize on opportunities in this game, and and details are so so important against these 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 top tier teams. Having said all that, man, I I really think for I don't know, three quarters of the game, at least the Packers outplayed that that Niners team. And it really did come down to the stuff we talked about last week, like defensive line outplayed their offensive line, that named Trent Williams. Um, it it kind of nullified some of the effect that Kittle and Yusha can have on that team. Debo not playing was I I think it was a two touchdown thing, to be fair. Like I, yeah. I think it was that it was that important. And then, you know, Jordan Love missed a couple throws early. They made he's made a couple throws late. Uh we're just not like we're, you know the Packers just quite frankly aren't there yet. Like they're not they're not good enough to beat that team five out of ten times yet. It's just not there. No, but the fact that they were like played like a C minus game and were in that situations too is like certainly at least hopefully like makes you hopeful moving forward that they're not that far off and that hopefully they're making the changes moving forward that can get them past a team like that. You posted a play. I don't think it's been talked about enough of all like the missed opportunities or what ifs in this game. And it's one of mine as well. There's a third and five on the final drive of the game where um, Brandon Ayuk throws low to, or sorry, uh, Brock Purdy throws low to Brandon Ayuk yeah. and Keyshawn Nixon has pretty freaking great coverage on the play. And it's just in a perfect spot. Ayuk makes a phenomenal diving catch. I don't know what San Fran does. If that ball falls incomplete, it would have gone to fourth and five. They're on their side of the field. I want to say there's like three and a half-ish minutes, mm -hmm. maybe four minutes left in the game. Maybe they go for it. Maybe they get it and it's all a moot point. Maybe they punt the ball away and Green Bay salts away the clock the rest of the game. I don't know what happens, but that was one of those of like all the you know missed field goals, interceptions, not interceptions, missed pick sixes of like, I didn't see many people talk about. That is a razor thin margin throw and catch. Nixon has great coverage and it's just... It, they made it, and it was a huge play in the game. There was there was a handful of plays in that middle of the field, the hash mark throws we talked about before, where you're just you couldn't believe that they got completed. Um, the Jennings one, yeah, and I th and I think the play before the one you're re you're referencing, if I'm right, I think Kittle Kittle or one of the tight ends caught a ball over on the left, and we kind of missed it. Like we missed two bad tackles over there on three, really on Kittle that uh, ended up in huge yards after catch. And, th and it, that kind of put them in a situation where they could go, you know, they felt good about their third and sixth play call. And so, you know, it just goes back again, like the, the margins for our are razor, razor thin when you're playing against elite level teams. And you have to be able to make plays when there are plays to be made. There, do you remember the Kittle one he saw on the crosser and they pass off to- uh, uh, Eric to, Wilson. They, yeah, at the last minute you're going like, I think it was I think it was Jair passed him off and he went back. I can't remember who corner was, but you're going like that's impossible. Like that is an impossible play. Like I don't know schematically that makes no sense. And it was uh, yeah, yeah. I think I thought it was Owens coming down. It was Owens. Was there's there's two plays in the game yeah. where they pass it off. One Eric Wilson's in the middle of the field and they're in six coverage. They're bringing five. The one you're talking about, Jair passes it off and says go go go, and Owens, Owens is sitting yeah. in the middle of the and field. You're just going and, like dear lord, that's 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 really that's a lot to ask and. He's like first team all pro. Like he's the best tight end in the league. Like let's go ahead and cover him. Um, it's those kind of things, especially when you start talking about defense, because you got to remember, like there's a, eleven things have to go right on offense, generally speaking, for for it to work, right? Like only one or two things have to go wrong, and you're a disaster. But yep. defensively, it's like it's just some kind of key moments. Like you can blow coverage over on the left if the, if the defensive end gets to the quarterback, doesn't matter. Or if he doesn't yeah. even look over there, it doesn't matter. So it's like these things, when you talk about defense, there's too many situations where, you know, we t we track tackle the wrong direction. We don't use leverage from the outside. So he, he turns back in and gets 10 more yards. Or, you know, we don't – we miss the pass off. And so we try to leg tackle the, you know, a guy who runs through every damn leg tackle on the planet and he gets another 20 yards. And it's like those kind of things – over the course of a game, it's like you don't think about those plays. They IU play like nobody, nobody's paying attention. Like that was a, it's just it's just too hard to win against really really good players. Like that guy's a second team All Pro for a reason. It's not it's not yeah. like a coincidence. He's been doing it all year. No, and it's it's those little things that add up to huge things over the course of a game. And unfortunately, there were just far too many of those little things that added up to huge huge things, and it ended up in a Packers loss. Um, one other thought on this game. 
I know you mentioned and posted one of your takeaways was that the linebackers were playing a little bit more downhill. I think you mentioned not only in this game, but through the course of the season, we saw Quay attacking a little bit more. Um, unless maybe I misunderstood your tweet, but I thought there were, or maybe it's something that they need to improve upon moving forward. Um, but uh, your thoughts on the linebackers and how they can play downhill moving forward. Well, that's, I think that's part of the, whoever comes in and establishes the new, the new scheme and, and structure. It just, it becomes, it's very obvious to, to me at least that at the beginning of the season, when Quays, every one of Quays tackles, you know, eight yards deep or, or more, and then you see him going downhill towards the line of scrimmage and like good things are happening. Now it's not perfect. Right. Yep. You can't, in other words, you can't do the same thing all the time, but just the general demeanor of Isaiah McDuffie, the general demeanor of Quay when he's playing downhill. I mean, those guys are really impactful players when you put them in situations to be impactful. When you put anybody on their heels, it's a much more difficult game. And what I think a lot, the other side of that is the defensive tackles benefit because now the way that you attack a double team, the way you attack the stretch play changes when you know you're going to be single blocked because that guy's coming off early. And I, the play I showed was, you know, you got George Kittle and Trent Williams going against Kenny Clark. I don't yeah. care how what Kenny does. Kenny's not winning that battle if Trent can stay on. But because we shoot the gap and Trent has to come off, now George Kittle's no match for Kenny Clark, and all of a sudden he's got to tackle for loss. So those things happen during the course of the season, but they just don't happen enough. And so what you, I think what you'd like to see from the next guy is – and what you do see from Fred Warner and, and, and Greenlaw, what you do see from Roquan and, and Queen, like the elite level of Frankie LeVu and the, the guys down in Carolina, when it's time to go, let's go. And let's go full speed and make plays. That's the kind of football like I grew up watching. That's, that's what I'm used to seeing. And, and the best guys in the league right now are attacking the line of scrimmage. It does feel like this team is set up a little bit more with some attacking level players and they don't really get to do it or haven't got to do it quite as much maybe in this Joe Barry defense. And maybe that will be a change for them moving forward. I'm right, moving past Packers 49ers. What were your biggest takeaways from this season? Things that you are confident about going into 2024 and some things that might need to get changed and improved going into this next season? Uh, I, I think the first thing is you you have to make sure that Aaron Jones is on the team next year. Yeah. I think the difference between uh, having Aaron Jones on the offense and not, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but its it's got to be ludicrous. He's um, hes the best player on the football team right now. And uh, hes I know he's 29 years old, and I know he's only 175 pounds, but he's, he's an elite, elite football player, and you need to hold on to him as long as possible. hes I think he took a $5 million pay cut last year to play. I don't think – I don't think he deserves to be asked that question this year. I think he's earned the right to get paid. I know he's a $17 million cap hit, so they're going to have to do something, but that's probably a multi-year deal. Maybe he's out for two more and then he retires, you know, goes into the sun. That's probably the most important thing for me. The second thing is you got to probably – there's two positions of real need here, and I don't know if free agency-wise they're willing to go get it, but, like, you need an offensive – you need a dominant offensive lineman on this team, a, a tone setter. And yeah. you you need to go out and get a safety. Now, whether you think that there's guys in the draft that can accomplish that, you have the coaches in those specific rooms to develop those guys, like that's a question that I'm not prepared to answer. But I do know if there's a big time I, – I don't think there's a big time offensive lineman on the market. You might have to trade for him. But if there's a big time guy in the draft, you need to draft him. And, and I think from a safety perspective, I just think between safety and linebacker right now, you just bring a real dominant personality into that, like that group, and you're going to you're going to get a lot more out of the guys you have in that building right now. Because I think you have some good guys in that in both those rooms, but I think you just need that you need that you know dominant personality, super confident in what they do, takes command of the of the group, is a, is a, a master like field general. I just don't know that we have that right now. Those are those are kind of two, I think maybe big areas of opportunity. Yeah, you're right. There's not a ton of. Uh... Not a ton of premium, especially interior offensive linemen. There's some offensive tackles. Ben Powers, a guard for the um, – oh, no, that was last year. Hold on, I might yeah. be in last year. Sorry, that was last year's. But um, either way, yeah, I, I don't think there's a ton. But either way, um, from a people safety don't get, People don't get rid of – people do not get rid of offensive linemen anymore. No. If you have really a good don't. one, you don't get rid of them. Uh, from a safety standpoint, though, a lot of guys that are available, um, you've got uh, – Antoine Winfield in Tampa, I'm sure they're going to do everything in their power to retain him. Xavier McKinney in the, with the Giants. Geno Stone, a player who had, I think, the most interceptions in the league for the Baltimore Ravens. So definitely some, some safeties on the list. Um, but, yeah, offensive line, like you said, guys don't guys don't move on. Once you find them, you keep them and do everything you can to hold on to them. Um, but, yeah, not, not a ton there. But I, I'm with you. I think 
I think from a red zone standpoint, specifically some of the stuff where they, they tr struggled to move people in the red zone, I think it would make things a little bit easier. If you got a couple, I don't know, maulers or more physical guys like you're talking about, I think that would make things easier. I, I will go on the record. I don't think Aaron Jones is going anywhere. I would be shocked, shocked, shocked if he's not back in some capacity. I think the other thing is you have to probably look for his long-term replacement um, and yeah. get somebody maybe with just a little more juice to back him up. So if he does have some hamstring injuries again next year, it does start to break down a little bit more. You have a more viable option that can still bring some of the same Aaron Jones-esque things to the offense, but I would be shocked if he goes anywhere. Yeah. And I think the other thing you have to look at is the future is bright, but the future is also like next year. I, and yeah. I don't, you know, I think your window is actually, it's it's open like you're open for Super Bowl business next year. I think in the mind of Goody, and the, what I say that because like you need to draft impact. Like again, I, I hate to go back to Lions because everybody go oh you're NFC North you know whatever. But like think of the Lions draft this year. Like number one in rushing rookie, number one in receiving rookie, number one in, in interceptions rookie. Like they're uh, every, and then and then their first the other first round pick Campbell is going to be an absolute unit in this league. Him and Anzalotti are going to be like the best tandem in the NFC North here. I mean, they're, they just got so many – I think they have Barnes too, but they got so many things going because they drafted people that everybody else is saying, bad pick, bad pick, bad pick. Don't draft a linebacker. Don't draft a running back. Don't draft a safety that. They just went out and picked the guys that they needed for their team right now, and those guys are going to still be players on their team for the next seven years. And so the Green Bay Packers, you got to look at this a little bit more. Like, I'm going to get five-plus years out of all these guys, and my window is probably five years because then after about five, you're going to have to re-up Jordan Love for a third time or, you know, third contract. And that's a problem. The positional draft stuff is always fun and funny. And then, you know, you get Jamar Gibbs and it's like, is anyone upset that they drafted a running back in the first round? Like that dude's an absolute stud or that they got Brian Branch in the second round or Laporta early in the second round, like draft good players and then figure out the rest later. And obviously there does some come, there comes some value stuff that you have to work, look at it sometimes. I think that more plays into if you are a team that's starting to build from scratch and things like that, they knew exactly where they were. They knew exactly what they needed. And they went out and drafted four premium players with their first four picks. And it has worked out unbelievably for them. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm saying that because the Packers are not in a dissimilar situation. If you just if you sat if you sat here and looked on the offensive side of the football and you assumed everybody was coming back healthy, I you could make the argument that you only really need to you don't need to get a single position. But if you want to get a single position, it would be a a, a one A running back, not a two, but a one A running back, or it would be a premium left tackle, right or a right guard, whatever. Pre, but premium, yeah. like I'm talking top twenty pick guy. And then on the defensive side, if you just again, if you're just taking things, new coordinator, you're gonna get the you're gonna that's gonna get a lot out of this defensive line is gonna continue to improve. We've got a ton of draft picks there already. What are you looking at? You're looking at a premium linebacker and you're looking probably at a premium safety. I mean, because you've already drafted five DBs or whatever in the last four years. So it's like the positions that you want aren't necessarily the sexy positions, but they're the necessary ones if you want to win now. And I I just you kind of hope going into this. That it's not. Let's show everybody how smart we are by, you know, pushing our picks back to get some good players in the first round that can play tomorrow. You know, like you just don't know if Tucker Craft's going to turn out the way that Tucker Craft did. But we also know that we could have had Sam Laporta if you yeah. wanted him, or you know, and Luke and Musk. I'm, I'm, you're not bad mouthing those guys, but it's like you go back to you go back to the draft stuff. I did. Uh, Sam Laporta's the number one guy for a reason. Like he's got the best technique. He's a he's a He's an Iowa athlete. Like it just it stuff makes sense, right? It jumps off the screen. So let's hope they do that. I think they will. Five top 100 picks. They've got I think 10 or 11 picks that they're going to have overall. They don't have that much room on their roster. Like I, if anything, I don't think they're going to necessarily be moving down for more guys. I think they might use some of those picks to move up and get some of those premium players because I do think Goody recognizes hey, we're not that far off. We just need a couple guys to really put this thing over the top, especially if they can do it on the defensive side of the ball or, like you said, running back, premium offensive lineman. I'm all in, and I think I think there's a good chance Goody might be as well. Before we let you go, Mike, you mentioned it at the, the very uh, beginning of the episode. Really fun weekend ahead. 49ers, Lions. Of course, you get Chiefs, Ravens, which should be an epic game as well. What are you looking forward to, and what are you going to be watching in those two games? Starting with the Chiefs Ravens, I, I think for me, the Baltimore Ravens are the I'm an offensive lineman. I like to run the football. I I watch the Baltimore Ravens and I just and the way they play defense, um, just the attitude that Roquan and, and Queen have on that side of the football. 
the the way the, the I just broke down their last game from the Texans game that the I'm talking about the off the Ravens offense now and you just you're in awe. First of all, their center is special, but Frank Ricard, the 295 pound fullback, and then Lamar Jackson. You just go and and Zay Flowers and all those guys are, are great players, but those three guys are just next level good and. Yeah. They kind of like the running game and the way that they operate against against the Chiefs defense. It's a really good defense. It shows you a bunch of different looks. I will be interested to see because even when you've got the RPO or the the run option stuff locked down, Lamar Jackson just does things that don't make sense, and he can throw balls off his back foot that don't make sense, and he runs away from pressure to buy time to throw a twenty yard out. It doesn't make sense. Like he, there's nothing that that guy can't do with a football in his hands. Right, and so he's probably the most entertaining. It's the most entertaining offense for me to watch, and so I'll be. I, although I'll probably pick the Chiefs because nobody picks against Patrick Mahomes. I just love watching the Baltimore offense play football. I love watching the Baltimore team. I love watching the Baltimore defense as well. Um, on the Niners Lions game, like if the Debo Sam, if Debo Samuel plays and he's healthy, I think the Lion, I think the Niners beat them handily. If it's if it's fair weather and the ball's not slippery, I think they beat them handily because I. You just saw Baker Mayfield kind of torch up that defense a little bit in the secondary, and Brock Purdy's got like you know what three three four all pros on that on that skill position group. Yeah. So I, I just look at that and go, as much as you like the Lions and everything they stand for, and I, as much as I, I I just love the coaching staff there, and I think Ben Johnson's um, you know one of the brightest young play callers in in the league. I just don't know how you keep up with that offense when you know everybody's healthy. And then knowing that as good as the Detroit Lions offensive line is, like that'll probably be the matchup of the day is the Detroit Lions offensive line versus yeah. the Niners defensive line. But you saw it against us, like as good as they were. I mean, we didn't talk about this, Abe, real quick, if you don't mind. One takeaway yeah. from one takeaway from the game that was just I thought was just a nutso move that was genius was like allowing your wide receivers to down block on those guys. But then when you sat there and you looked at them and you looked in their three point stance, it was like. Oh, that makes total sense. And Aaron Jones had to do some like crazy turns on wet grass to like make that work. Yeah. But if you've got a guy that can do that, like just the their length of their stance and the only way they can go is up. I mean, just you just went, oh yeah, that I totally works. That was that was such a smart uh, decision when they were game planning by the Packers. But I think that matchup, anyways, the Lions O line and, and the the Niners D line from a from a trenches perspective is going to be a fun one to watch. Dontavian Wicks and Christian w Wicks, especially, but Christian Watson had one too. We're so good on those down blocks and just uh, holding up against defensive linemen and um, allowing some of those runs to take place. And like you said, Jones deserves so much freaking credit for what he was able to accomplish in that game. Would have been interesting. There was the, he said that on that 50 some yard run, he felt something in his hamstring again. He stayed in the game, but that would have been something if they did play this week, that would have been really interesting to monitor if he would have been able to go and play a full game against Detroit. But um, unfortunately, we are not talking about that. We're talking about Lions 49ers instead. Mike, this has been uh, a joy every single week. I think this is our third year doing it now. Um, obviously, we'll hope, uh, hopefully we can do it again next year, and I'm sure we'll hopefully try to touch base at some point this offseason, maybe around the draft again. But um, plug anything you want to plug, rant anything you want to rant. The floor is yours, uh, and thanks so much <laughs> again for doing this. No, just thanks for having me on, and it's a lot of fun talking ball with you guys. And um, listen, it – the 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 fan side of this i think is is what makes the sport go right and i my the hope is always that you know when you can listen to us interact and have conversations about the game it just helps you know hopefully it helps people maybe take a little bit of the emotion out and appreciate the nuances of the game a little bit more so when you're sitting around with your friends you're watching the football game you can you can enjoy it at a different level man because the 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 fun of competition and prep and getting ready for competition, all this stuff. I, I can just tell you, there's there's nothing like it, and it, it sure is hell fun to even now for me. It's it's fun to talk about on the daily. I like to think um, that we've cultivated an audience here um, in general on the the show that is the nerdiest, you know, Packer fans that want every nuance and you know salary cap take X and O draft nuance like all of it. And I, I can't tell, I don't know if you ever have a chance to look at the comments or not, but the comments every single week are about, you know, when you and I get together and chat about this stuff are, you know, people constantly about what they're learning from the game. 
Mike, I learn every something every single week talking to you. So um, I appreciate the the time, effort, and energy that you put into it. And like I said, it's a joy every single time. So enjoy your off season. I know you're going to be working with uh, athletes. I know you're going to be doing some draft stuff. And um, obviously, everyone make sure to to follow the On My Block podcast. But I'll let you uh, get your plugs in on the way out here. Yeah, I think I'm going to change the uh, the name of that podcast to Block Party. We, my my wife used to make when we when we had t when we were when we were going to away games on the West Coast. That's where I'm from, and uh, my wife would always make uh, Mike Wall Block Party T-shirts for all the people that were tailgating. And, and, and like my family, like when we tailgate, we tailgate like it's a real deal. So you could see all these guys stumbling around with these Block Party T-shirts on. So I think I'm going to change the name of the, the show. Uh oh, I'm just going to walk out on you, I guess. But I'm going to change the name to the show to to, to Block Party, and uh, we'll be doing it. some. I think we'll be doing some stuff, maybe more focused on some um, some other teams during the off season. I think I might do if I I, I might start putting up some uh, so a little bit of technique tape for for you know anybody who really wants to see it, just so we can get a uh, get a different perspective on some of the. I see so much bad stuff on the internet now. I've you're supposed to keep everything proprietary, but uh, I, I've always felt like if you can share information, if somebody can do it better than you, then good for them. Um, and I don't know how many, I don't, I'm pretty confident that in, in, in those specific things in my life. So um, awesome. look, be looking for that. Yeah. Make sure to check it out. Of course you can find him at Mike wall 68. Love the, love the new name, by the way, definitely do that. That's a perfect name. Um, of course you can find the podcast at pack a day podcast. You can find me at Andy Herman NFL. That is going to do it for us today, but until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go.